Good evening. Good evening and welcome to this uh, inaugural lecture. Uh, I'm Richard Black. I'm the uh, Pro Vice Chancellor and Head of the College of Social Sciences. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening and to see the, the Bramall so full. Um, first of all, I would just want to make a brief announcement that this is, of course, a lecture on autism in education and out of respect for some audience members, I'm going to ask that this evening, rather than clapping, that we do hand wave clapping, please. Okay? So, so it's quite great pleasure to introduce uh, Karen Goldberg, whose inaugural lecture this is. Um, Karen was born in Edinburgh, but moved to Norway when she was only three years old. And it comes as no surprise that she ended up in academia, as she was heavily influenced by two academic parents. Her mother was a, was a Scottish consultant psychiatrist with an outgoing and energetic personality, and her father was more reserved and a quiet Norwegian professor of pharmacology who ended his career as clinical director of one of the largest hospitals in Norway. Karen is the eldest of five siblings. She's the proud mother of three sons, Marcus, Aidan and Stefan, who I think might be here. Um, she lives with her partner, Pete, who's been an important support to her over the years. I know it means how much, uh, how much it means to Karen to have family and friends supporting her tonight, and in particular her sons and her sisters, Helene and Kathinka, along with Peter's children, Anna and Jamie. I'm guessing you're all at the front here, so welcome to all of you. Karen left Norway after the equivalent of A-levels to travel. She worked as a social therapist in a psychiatric hospital for a while before deciding to study social anthropology and linguistics at the University of Manchester, two fabulous subjects. Subsequently, she qualified as a teacher and worked in mainstream schools, a special school, and a local authority outreach, autism outreach team for a number of years, specialising in teaching autistic pupils. Karen has a long association with the University of Birmingham. She enrolled in 1997 for an M.Ed. in Autism on the course she now co-leads whilst working as a teacher. It's not a completely unknown uh, career tra trajectory for our staff in the School of Education. After graduating from her Master's, she was appointed to a lecturing position in 2001, and her brief was to develop a web-based programme for practitioners and caregivers of individuals with autism. She brought her passion and commitment to this project, working closely with a fantastic team, and the Web Autism Project was launched in January 2002. Karen's experience with the program led her to undertake a PhD that used social learning theory to investigate how students learned through online discussions. I hope I'm not giving away too much of your actual lecture here, Karen. <laughs> Since completing her PhD, she's been principal co-investigator of 30 research projects, receiving funding from a wide range of funders, including the EU, the Department of Education, and the Autism Education Trust. Karen has a particular interest in the innovative use and study of technology enhanced learning for autistic pupils. This is it included the humanoid robot, NAO, is that what we're calling him, her? which works with autistic pupils to develop their social communication. Karen has published over 40 papers and has a book being published with Routledge shortly. She was co-founder of the Autism Centre for Education Research, or ASA, in 2007, and has been its director since 2010. This is a successful and unique research centre of international importance in the autism education field. Karen is also Deputy Head and Head of Research for the Department of Disability, Inclusion and Special Needs at the School of Education. As Programme Lead of the first year of the Autism Children Distance Learning Programme, she ensures that research informs and is integrated into the course. Karen's teaching is student-centred, innovative and consistently gains positive feedbacks from, from students, tutors and external examiners. She won a Head of School Excellence in Teaching Award in 2008 in partnership with her team. And in 2009, she won a Teaching Fellowship at the University of Birmingham in a competitive process open to 2,500 staff. She's also a Senior Fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Karen has led the development of a number of online resources, including the Early Years Inclusion Development Programme for the Department of Education, and an online resource for GPs and primary care practitioners for National Education Scotland. She led the initial development of the Autism Education Trust Professional Development Programme, which has now been delivered to 220,000 educators in England. 
This work has contributed to improving educational practices in early year settings and schools, enhanced the delivery of professional services and impacted autism education in a number of countries. In summary, Karen's work focuses on bridging gaps between research and practice in autism education. By working in collaborative partnerships with a range of different stakeholders, her research has had a significant social impact. She has a strong commitment to teamwork and to making a difference to the lives of autistic people and their families. And on that, with no further ado, I introduce to you uh, Karen Goldberg. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate seeing so many members of my family here, my friends, my colleagues, and my students. That means a lot uh, to me. Now, some of you have told me that I don't really know anything about autism. Other people are conducting PhDs in the study. We've got quite a few PhD students uh, here. Um, and others, I know there are people here who've worked in the field of research or practice in classrooms and schools for over 30 years. So there's no tall order there to be able to say something meaningful uh, for all of you, but I'm going to do my very, very best. So I'm going to be looking at the question of developing excellence in autism research and practice, but with a focus on education. Education is the focus for my work. And I'm going to refer to current research, and I'm going to give you a really um, high-level overview of research. Obviously, in the time I've got available, I can't go into a lot of detail, but I'm going to give you an overview of a framework that I use for understanding how we can develop good educational practice in our classrooms. And that framework draws on both research and practice. So my talk is going to draw on both uh, research and practice, and to be grounded in both. But before I say anything else, I just want to share a little story with you about how I joined this world and this journey of understanding more about autism, of understanding autistic people, and of trying to play a small role in making a difference to autistic pupils and their families. And that happened 25 years ago uh, when a young boy called Dominic, seven-year-old, joined my class. I was working in a school for children with severe learning difficulties at the time, and Dominic uh, joined my class. Dominic was autistic. He was non-verbal, uh, but he did communicate uh, through sounds, and also he had reasonably good functional communication in that he could come and tell us... And, hold us by the hand to take us to a glass of water if he was thirsty, for example. He was also incredibly agile. Um, I've never, ever seen a child who could balance like he could on the top of playground equipment. Uh, and he um, was very, very active and very energetic. I took him up Glastonbury Tour once, and I had very little chance of uh, keeping up with him. And I was reasonably fit at the time, I thought, myself, anyway. Um, but Daniel, why am I telling you, uh, sorry, Dominic, why am I telling you about Dominic? I'm telling you about Dominic because when I was teaching him, I realized very quickly that my instincts did not prepare me for being a good teacher for Dominic. And neither did my training as a teacher. Neither of those were good enough. I didn't know how to be a good enough teacher for Dominic. So... A long story, I cut a long story short, I spoke to some colleagues and they told me about the master's programme at the University of Birmingham and I embarked on that and that did change my life and it changed the way that I worked as a teacher because what that course did was enable me to understand how research and theory can inform practice but the most important thing was the need to understand autism. If you don't understand autism it's very difficult for you to be a good teacher. Okay, so I, next I want to really give you um, some facts and figures then for why education, getting education right, is such an important issue. Um, you might not be able to see very well this pointer, but at the top left there you can see that the prevalence figures for autism are 1%. Um, many studies are saying that the that it's higher than 1%, but the most robust study that we tend to use uh, in the UK is the study which says 1% uh, of people are on the autism spectrum. 
72% of people, it varies a little bit from year to year, 72% of pupils are in mainstream schools in England. And some very interesting facts, if you look at the top middle here, um, the number of pupils with autism as their primary special educational need nearly doubled between 2012 and 2018 in the UK. Now, what do these figures tell us? They tell us that most teachers working in classrooms will at some point in their career be teaching a child with autism, whether they're working in a mainstream school, a special school, or a specialist uh, provision. Now for some of the more worrying statistics. Uh, I don't know how many people saw the news items about the annual Ofsted report in 2018, when um, the head of Ofsted highlighted that 27 percent of pupils with special educational needs and disabilities had a fixed-term exclusion the year before. 27 percent. That is a shocking statistic. And then if you look um, at the middle one, middle, sorry, you can't see this, but the middle uh, figure there, exclusions of autistic pupils from schools rose by 58.9%. These figures come from the Department for Education. They rose by 58.9% between 2011 and 2016. So we talk about the importance of inclusion, and yet this is the reality. Only 16% of autistic adults in the UK are in full-time paid employment, and only 32% in some form of paid work. And going back to education, the all-party parliamentary group for autism found in their survey found that fewer than five in ten teachers felt confident to teach a pupil with autism, and over half of parents said that they had kept their child out of school for fear that the school was not able to provide appropriate support for their child. To me, this really, really indicates the importance of us getting it right in education. And I do firmly, passionately believe that education is the arena that can make the greatest difference for autistic uh, children, young people, uh, and adults when we talk about lifelong education. So we need to seek social change. We need to work towards social change so that we have a more equitable society and so that we can try and facilitate change through education. And I know there are many people here who are involved in that process already, which is incredibly positive. So in my presentation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at how we can develop a more holistic understanding of autism by drawing on different disciplines. Because the autism world is often full, full of contradictions. Uh, do we adhere to a medical model of autism or a social model of autism? There's lots of conflict and disagreement about how we should view autism. I want to look at trying to bring together different disciplines and to look at what we can gain and take from those different disciplines. And then I want to talk a little bit about why do we need a closer alignment um, between research and practice in autism education. And finally, I'm going to talk about the implications from the answers of those two questions for the kind of teaching approaches and methods that we need in our classrooms. Okay, so let's just start um, with the notion, and this is really, really important, and most of us who will do talks on autism will stress this point, so bear with me if you've heard this before, but there are many people here who don't know anything about autism, and it's very important to make this point that although people with autism share certain features, their autism will affect them in very, very uh, different ways. And how they, uh, that what their needs are will develop over time and change over time. So thinking about children that I've taught, I think about Christina. She arrived in my classroom um, at the age of three with no language. Um, she was still in nappies. She had a phobia about going to the toilet. She found it very, very difficult to uh, work on anything that any teacher wanted her to work on. That was when she was three, two years later. Uh, and lot ha lots happened in between, but two years later, 
She was reading really well. Uh, she, she was her speaking and listening. It was difficult to get her to be quiet. <laughs> um, her language had developed in leaps and bounds, and she'd got to the point where she was ready to go to mainstream school. So her needs were very, very different uh, at that stage. Uh, Dave, Dave was another um, pupil that I had who arrived with us at the age of five, having been expelled from two schools already at the age of five, from an uh, early years nursery and then from a special school, actually. And uh, his behavior was that he was, he was spitting uh, nearly all the time and he was lashing out and swiping anything that um, got in his way and often lashing out at people around him. And many people find it very, very difficult to cope with this uh, behavior. And we had to observe very carefully to understand what this behavior meant and why Dave was behaving in the way that he did. And to cut a very long story short, we found that he, we knew that he was um, blind in one eye. Um, but what had been happening was that people would often um, come up on the side of him. He was blind in the right eye, if I remember correctly. People would come up on the side of him. He wouldn't see them coming, and he was also very, very... He had real hyper hypersensitivities to touch. And then suddenly somebody would grab him. He was scared. He found that uh, really difficult to deal with. And the only way he knew how to communicate to that person that they shouldn't be doing this was to lash out. And then those behaviors became more and more embedded because people responded in a way which he actually found quite amusing. And it be almost became um, embedded in him that this is the way that he behaved um, all the time. And, and it was very, very uh, repetitive. Fast forward 10 years. I am in Cornwall giving some training to some teachers. And a teacher comes up to me and says, I've read your reports on Dave. I taught him in secondary school, which is fantastic because you don't often know what happens to children after you've taught them and you've moved to a different school or a different area. And he said, I saw Dave last night. I went to Sainsbury's and he was shopping with his mum and they were laughing and giggling and he was helping her with the shopping. Well, when I knew Dave's mum, she was at the end of her tether. She said the family hadn't been able to go out and do anything as a family for two years um, because of uh, the behaviours. So again, you can see there that needs can change a lot over time, and hopefully these examples are examples of the difference that education potentially can make. And that was because Dave had the right kind of input from the right kind of people at the right time. So although people with autism share certain features, their autism will affect them uh, in different ways. But what are these features that people with autism share then? I am going to put a definition up here. Um, we have had some sessions uh, earlier with our students, our master's uh, students, and then um, Rita Jordan made the point that you can't really define autism, but I'm going to make an attempt at doing that because I think this de definition tells us quite a lot that autism is a lifelong neurodevelopmental condition that affects how people perceive, communicate, and interact with the world. So what this definition is saying, and this is where um, you'll see where I'm going with this and why I want to draw on these dis different disciplines uh, to explain my points. What this definition is saying is that autism will affect a person biologically. There's a biological basis for autism. That will, in turn, influence how the person processes and experiences the world. Whilst their development and their experience will also be affected by how they're supported and educated. So we have the biological in there, we have the psychological, and we also have the social. And all of those are really important uh, for us to be able to uh, draw upon. So that's where I think that a biopsychosocial approach is incredibly important in terms of knowledge. But I will get on to talk about where the emphasis or what's most important about these different uh, arenas too. But we do need to draw on, a different domains of, on different domains of knowledge and you'll see that the person is at the center there. So the meaning making and the experiences of the autistic person has to be at the center of all of this. Okay, so I want to touch on each of these domains and these knowledge bases and talk about 
What has emerged from those? What do we know? Now, you have to bear in mind that I'm going to summarize in maybe less than a minute <laughs> whole fields with hundreds and hundreds and thousands of papers, actually. Um, but but uh, hopefully, I'm going to do it uh, justice. So there's a lot of studies on the genetic basis for autism, for example, and different studies have come up with different genes, indicating that different genes have been affected. But what uh, is emerging from those studies is that it's likely, autism is likely to be caused by the action of multiple genes. So there's a number of different genes that might be acting together to cause autism. There's also differences in, um, there's also a lot of research happening in brain imaging on the notion of whether there are differences in the structure and the function of the brain. Although, again, brain imaging studies have come up with very, very different uh, findings. It does look quite likely that the cerebral cortex is probably organized in an unusual way. And that part of the brain is the most developed part of the brain that is responsible for processing, thinking, uh, understanding, and using language. But we do know that the biological basis for autism are probably quite diverse, and there's studies now looking into are there different biological bases for different kinds of representations of autism. So that's an important point to make, but also very important to say there are no valid biological markers for autism. So you can't take a blood test or look at an image of a brain and diagnose autism as a result of that. Autism is still diagnosed through the diagnostic and statistical manuals by medical pro professionals um, and uh, signifies core developmental differences in two key areas. It used to, we used to talk about the triad of impairment. Some of you will be aware of that. Um, but since the diagnostic and statistical manual number five, the social understanding and communication have been brought together instead of having been separate, separated the way they were before. Um, social and communication difficulties are seen as a core difficulty, and this includes um, nonverbal communication and the ability to use and understand body language, eye contact, facial expressions and gestures, as well as the development of friendships and relationships. And the second core difficulty there is related to restricted and repetitive patterns of behaviours. Now, this language that is used in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manuals is not my language. This is the language used in those manuals, and we'll come on to say something about that in a moment. But when a diagnosis is made, um, the, the health professional will look at a series of behaviours that might, for example, be adherence to routines or resistance to change, or look at the intense interests, which often go along with this uh, second um, uh, uh, developmental uh, difference. But also, very, very importantly, sensory processing differences has now been recognized as a core uh, difference within the diagnostic uh, criteria. And if you ever speak to uh, an autistic adult or you observe autistic children in the classroom or you work with autistic children, you will know that very, very many people with autism will have sensory uh, uh, sensitivities or a different sensory processing style. So the biological and medical domains have given us clear pointers to how genetics or the functioning of the brain might impact on a person. But Many of us, and I know this includes many people in this room, will take issue with the focus on and the language of impairment, of dysfunction, or deficit in this. And we'd rather look at autism as a different way of being rather than a disordered uh, way of being. So what do we know about the domain of uh, psychology in autism? Well, psychology is really um, the study of how we perceive, attend, listen to, make sense of our environments. And that can really inform the distinctive educational practices that are required uh, for pupils on the autism um, spectrum. Now, I would argue that it's very important to focus on the emotional, the cognitive, and the developmental in this, 
But if you look at autism research over the last um, 20, 30 years, there is a tendency to focus on their cognitive uh, level of explanation and to investigate often psychological functioning as something which is innate in people rather than the product of the language and culture through which uh, they emerge. So, for example, Sue Fletcher Watson and Francesca Happe are two people who've just um, uh, published a new book, a in new introduction to autism, and they make the point that cognitive theories aim to span the gulf between biology and behavior through hypotheses about the mind. And so what happens then is that a lot of these studies, they devise behavioral experiments to test the hypotheses about how people with autism are different from people without it. And there are some key um, theories that many of you might have uh, heard about. Uh, there's theory of mind, there's executive functioning, there's central coherence. Uh, these are all uh, different theories and hypotheses that have been put forward about what the core difficulties are on the level of psychological functioning uh, for autistic people. And I think uh, and all of them have had a lot of debate and they have research studies that have either backed up the hypothesis or haven't backed up the hypothesis. But from a view point of view of people who are caring for or working directly with people with autism, I think there are some useful things that we can take from these theories and insights, um, but they can never explain fully every single person uh, with autism. And I'll just briefly explain to you the theory of mind is really about the ability to uh, understand the mental states of oneself and the others, so really about push putting yourself in the shoes of, a, of somebody else. So, and they might behave in a certain way, and you can draw some, you draw some uh, conclusions about what the intentions of their behavior was. Um, executive functioning is really about maintaining an appropriate problem-solving set to attain a particular goal. So functions that involve planning, working memory, impulse control, inhibition, and mental flexibility. Um, as well as initiating and monitoring of actions, comes under that whole umbrella of executive functioning and the hypothesis that many people with autism um, have differences in relation to executive functioning. And central coherence is about the ability to draw together bits of information to make sense of situations or events according to the context, to be able to see the big picture. Now, these are just three examples of hypotheses and theories that have been put forward uh, in autism. I'm emphasizing them because of their focus largely on the cognitive. Um, I'm emphasizing them not because I think that they uh, give us the definitive answers, but we have learned something from all the debates that have existed around those theories, and that have had some implications for how we might understand some of the difficulties that the pupils that we work with might have. But I think that um, one of the biggest problems with uh, that way of looking at things is that we can't reduce the mind to the biological mechanics of the brain. There's much more to how we develop as human beings, all of us, and the ability to think is tied in with social interaction. It's not merely tied in with brain development. There is a social interplay that shapes how we are, who we are in the world, whether we're talking about the classroom, the school, or the community in which we exist. And theories around intersubjectivity, of which Peter Hobson uh, has um, uh, written a fantastic book called The Cradle of Thought, and Rita Jordan, who sits over here, has had a, a major influence on education uh, in relation to uh, that theoretical uh, um, framework. And the stress is on the social, that autistic pupils require, as Rita says, education for those aspects of development that others acquire intuitively. They need explicit teaching of how to attend to and learn from others, because their intentionality, or the intentionality of autistic minds, is orientated differently and is less directed at emotional connectivity with others. And many, many studies show that from the minute babies are born, that many autistic children, so studies in visual cognition will show that 
babies from a very, very young age uh, who uh, then acquire a diagnosis of autism will tend to look more at objects or certain parts of the face, um, but less be less orientated towards um, uh, other humans. And this is a really important point, and I think it's a really important point for education, because we talk about the notion that autism is transactional. You know, it's not about the individual child having a whole load of impairments that need to be cor corrected. Another point that Rita makes is, if you saw somebody with autism and you were observing them on a desert island and they were the only person that was there, could you draw the conclusion that they were autistic? Do you think you could? No, because their autism comes out in relation to relationships with other people and the environment around them. And so the, the logic of that then is, as teachers or as people who care for or work with people with autism, that must mean that we have to hold more than half the solution, as Carol Gray says. We have to be willing to change how we communicate, how we behave, how we interact, and how we adapt environments. Because it's a two-way interplay and it's a two-way uh, process. So in education, when we talk about a transactional uh, approach, I'll just give you a few examples. So we've got four key areas of difference that really impact on how we need to think and how we need to change things in uh, classrooms or in any other provisions. For this, this goes right the way through uh, childhood through to adulthood. Changing our communication and language. Rita talked earlier about processing time. Absolutely crucial. And I, I, for one, am very guilty of this, and I often think that in relation to Dominic when he came into my classroom. I never gave him enough processing time. He needed much more processing time than I could give. Even now when I'm working with children, I know that I don't give them enough processing time, which is pro probably partly why the robot is so great with the kids, because the robot is a bit slow. You know, the technology hasn't quite caught up uh, that the robot can respond really quickly. And yet, when you give processing time, the child is more likely to spontaneously communicate and interact with you. Similarly, if we simplify our language, the research studies have shown that children will uh, initiate communication more as a result of that. So on every single level, we need to think about the social understanding of the young child or young person, the way that they might be processing the world, and then we have to make allowances for that. And we really, really have to take on board the sensory uh, perception. So every school should be conducting a sensory profile of a child as soon as the child comes into the school so that we know whether there are sensory sensitivities. Because if you are very, very sensitive to noise, how do you cope in a classroom? Are you sitting in front of a teacher who might be running a literacy hour for you? I've been in that position where I was observing a child in a reception class. He, he was very, very bright. He was sitting on the floor, and I was observing him. Teacher was uh, talking to the class. He was attending in the beginning, and then suddenly he stopped attending. And he kept looking out of the window, kept looking out of the window. And I thought, I don't know why he's looking out the window. I couldn't hear anything. And he could hear a digger that was a long, long way away. I had no chance of hearing that. But the minute he heard that digger, he was so sensitive to that noise that he couldn't refocus his attention back on the, uh, on the teacher. So we really do need to find out and be aware of uh, whether where the child's differences might be in relation to these. So moving on to the social uh, domain then, um, that is really about changing the focus from fixing the person uh, or trying to normalize, as has often been the case, and many approaches try to do that, um, to removing barriers and adapting uh, their environment. And often that does, um, in many countries, it means that trying to really deal with stigma. Um, two years ago, some of um, my colleagues and I did some research in Qatar, and what we found there was that less than 10% of the children, based on what we thought the prevalence figures should be, we thought we drew the conclusion that less, less than 10% of autistic pupils were actually in school. We had so many anecdotal stories from people. 
about children, young people, and adults never leaving the family home. And that was partly because the family were worried about the stigma that they were facing in the outside world, but it was also often because that's the only way that they felt they could protect their families. So the social looks at how we can remove barriers and how we can deal with uh, stigma. And in relation to uh, the social sciences and, the, and broader research at the moment, we've identified four key areas that we think um, the research is really starting to look at more and needs to look at more. Uh, for example, culturally and linguistically diverse children and families are completely underrepresented in research. We know, and you saw the figures, about autistic children and young people being more vulnerable to exclusion from education, from services, and also from their peers, actually. Um, we also know that there is increased awareness and increased risk of mental health difficulties, and many, many adults with autism will tell you that anxiety is often an overriding emotion that they have experienced throughout their school years. There is lots more research now on girls and women on the spectrum. There's a recognition that the figure of four males to one female is probably not correct because uh, there's a lot of... Um, discussion about whether females are better at masking their difficulties and therefore less likely to be diagnosed. So there's a lot of work happening in that area too. So the social domain has a lot to offer us. So what I'm putting forward is the need for a biopsychosocial bio approach with the person at the centre of it. Recognising that autism will affect the person biologically and then that influences how the person processes and experiences the world, as I said before. Um, and how they're supported and educated is absolutely crucial in all of this. And I'm going to get on to talk about eight principles of good autism practice that we have developed for education. Um, so I want to dwell now on the insider perspective or lived experience. It's very difficult to know what language to use here and what's the most appropriate language to use here. But in recent years, there have been many more powerful autobiographies, blogs, novels and movies about the lived experience of autistic people. And I do think for all our students, we really encourage you to read as much around this because these perspectives, they're really encouraging us to examine our own assumptions about what's supposedly normal or normality, what's, what, to, what is meant by impairment and difference, and it's challenging the basis for how many people are viewing autism. And these narratives, I really, really feel that they can help us become better at seeing autism as a multi-dimensional tapestry of abilities and difficulties. And it's about valuing the realism that comes from living with something day in and day out, because that way we can get a more in-depth understanding and acceptance, and the acceptance part of it is really, really important. And the crucial thing here for education is for those of us, there are people here I know who have probably written, uh, read 15 to 20 different biographical accounts, and there is usually a thread that runs through there, and that is that autistic people often make the point that it's not autism itself that causes the difficulties, but it's the expectations, the interactions, and the responses that they get from other people. So why am I dwelling on the need for this holistic and integrated understanding by drawing upon different disciplines? Well, first of all, I want to put a case for what education has to offer. Because this quote shows you that although there is no unified theory on learning, and anyone working in education will probably be quite aware of that, the power of education as a discipline comes from the fact that we can understand learning from the perspective of the individual learner as well as the context. Yet, most research in autism studies is narrowly focused on specific disciplines and specific areas of development. Even in intervention research, which is looking at um, what they call interventions or approaches for um, supporting um, people therapeutically, they will often look at very narrow range of skills, and the way that they measure whether they've been successful with what they've done, is often really narrow as well. And quite often, in many studies, they're using IQ uh, as, as a measure of outcome. Whereas we know 
that if we're really going to look at what's a good outcome for a person with autism, most autistic people will tell us, and the research tells us, is they want to be able to live the life that they want to live. They want to have a good quality of life, and they want to have well-being, uh, and they want to be able to have choice in their life. So the problem with current research in autism is that it very much takes place still outside classrooms, in clinical or lab settings. So actually, when researchers talk about what works, they are actually talking about what works in the research context, not necessarily about what works in a classroom. So those of you who are students, be critical about every single research study that you read, because we do need to understand what the implications are for classroom practice. And I feel very sad about the fact that practitioners are often um, given a secondary role as appliers of research rather than contributors to it. And autistic people are often ignored when it comes to uh, really um, uh, identifying what the research priorities uh, should be. So the conclusion then is that practitioner work, given that it happens in institutional settings, that provide continual challenges, uh, research knowledge, that research knowledge can only guide at a general level. So research knowledge, it can't give you the ready-made answers. There is no... In the, in aut in the autism world, there's been a lot of... Um, the idea that you can have a manualised treatment and that you need to plonk that down on all children. So if you're a proponent of applied behaviour analysis, you think that all children, not everybody's like this, but that all children should have that particular um, approach. We can't use that as a starting point. We have to use the individual as a starting point. You can't manualise when you've got people who are so, so, so uh, different from uh, one another. And the other interesting thing about research and uh, practice is that in research, we tend to try and control or isolate confounding factors so that we can judge the efficacy of treatment. That's what often happens in intervention research. But in the classroom, is we have to accommodate, not control, we have to accommodate a number of factors as well as account for the contextual and the individual uh, differences. So there are major differences in those environments. And that's not to say that research isn't important, it's that we need to realign how we do that research. And we need a better alignment between research and practice so that both can contribute together to improving the school experiences of autistic uh, pupils. So my argument would be uh, that this way of um, looking at it is really important, that if we are developing good autism practice, we need to draw on the insider perspectives, and increasingly people are recognising that. Autistic people, Damien Milton talked earlier about autistic involvement moving from tokenism to real involvement in research. Autistic people need to be involved in de defining what the research priorities should be, but also to be involved in research projects. We need to have some knowledge about biopsychosocial uh, from those disciplines. We need to have some conception about theory and research, and we also need to ground uh, what we understand and know in practice-based knowledge and policy. And that's really what I'm going to uh, focus on in the last part of my talk, in that I'm going to look at how we developed eight key principles of good autism practice. So my colleague Kirsten Wittemeyer and my colleague Ryan Bradley and I, we were commissioned by the Autism Education Trust uh, to look very carefully at the current research evidence and to develop principles of good autism practice that were also grounded in policy. So these, these, the report will be out in the next month or two and the report clearly un shows the underpinning research for everything that we're putting forward, but it also every principle is linked very clearly with the SEND code of practice and also with the new Ofsted framework. So it's grounded in policy, it's also grounded in insider perspectives because we had the AET youth panel advising us about the different principles and it's grounded in current uh, practice. So these are basically the eight principles of good autism uh, practice that we have developed. Uh, I'm not going to go through every single one of those because those of you who would like to <laughs> follow up can. 
You will see on the outside here, we have four key themes. I don't know if you can read it very easily. You might have to sort of go upside down. We wanted to have a circle because we wanted to show how clearly everything is interrelated. But these four key themes on the outside were the themes that we developed for the Autism Education Trust back in 2011 when we developed their professional development program. And these were ground, grounded in research. They emerged from research and from practice. So we're saying that in educating children, we have to understand the individual. It's important to build pos positive and effective relationships. Enabling environments is absolutely crucial. And we need to understand the specific learning and developmental uh, needs of pupils uh, with autism. Now, if you look at some of these principles, you're probably thinking, well, how are those distinct and specific to autistic uh, children? Well, um, what we've tried to do is distinguish, and we're building on Anne Lewis and Bram Norwich's work um, that has continued, it started really in 2005, when they were looking at different dimensions of pedagogy. We're building on that work um, to look at how there might be an interrelationship between having broad, inclusive principles broad inclusive principles that apply to all children, but recognizing that if you're going to really be successful in implementing those inclusive principles, then they need to be based on distinct group-based needs of autistic pupils. We need to understand their distinct learning needs. And I would say in a nutshell, I suppose, and we need to understand individual needs, the individual child. But this is basically um, what we're engaged with in our disability inclusion and special needs department is that we're understanding inclusion and inclusion pr principles more broadly, but we're also digging down to understand how that might look different to different children with different vis uh, disabilities, whether they've got visual impairment, hearing impairments, or autism. So it's about understanding distinct uh, group needs. And the distinct group needs of children with autism arise directly from their developmental differences that I've touched upon, um, and particularly from the fact that they don't necessarily learn through social interaction in the way that other children do. So just very quickly to wrap up on, on the principles here then, in the report, we identify the overarching principles. So here it is to understand the strengths, differences, and challenges of each individual. And then we look at what's distinctive for autistic pupils. I've just pulled out some key points here. Teachers really need to know the areas of difference. Teachers also need to know that lots of pupils with autism will have co-occurring uh, difficulties. They might have epilepsy, they might have ADHD. They will have other co-occurring difficulties quite often. They will often have uneven development. So Dominic was very, very good at puzzles. He was really good at maths, but he struggled a lot in relation to his communication and uh, language. And the sensory differences are crucial. When it comes to the Salamanca Statement back in 1994, stressed the need to listen to the voice of children and for children to have a say and control in their education. I think control, having control over how we learn is important for every single one of us. And um, for children with autism, so, so they need to be able to uh, contribute and to and influence decisions. And for a teacher, how, what, what, does, what does, does that mean in terms of um, somebody who's caring for or working with a person with autism? Well, you need to identify for the individual person the most appropriate and developmentally relevant means to enable social communication. Collaboration with parents. Parents of children with autism face very specific uh, challenges. A lot of parents that I worked with would tell me how difficult they would find it, that their child might not initiate communication very readily with them. They struggled a lot with that, and they would often find that they reduced the amount of communication that they initiated themselves because uh, the to and fro of, uh, of communication was, so, uh, uh, was such hard work uh, for them. So very, very important to understand the unique uh, difficulties that parents of children on the autism spectrum might have and also the impact that stress might have on those parents. And quite often, parents of children with autism will have what is described as the broader autism phenotype, so they might have some similar type difficulties uh, to their children. Workforce development is crucial. All the surveys that have asked, all the surveys that I know of, that have asked autistic pupils about what would make a difference in education for them, 
they've all come out very clearly and said, if only my teacher understood me a bit better. Yeah? Now, that just says it all. That, that, that makes it very, very clear that we have to take workforce development seriously uh, and understanding autism is absolutely paramount. Similar leadership and management that promotes and embeds good autism practice. Very, very difficult to do that if you haven't got leadership and management uh, behind you. And leadership and management is absolutely uh, crucial. And it's unlawful not to take account of the needs of children, young people, or adults uh, who you're working for. The ethos and environment that fosters social uh, inclusion uh, there are a number of different um, um, issues that we've identified in that, but we do know that structured, understandable and predictable environments can often uh, be very, very helpful to autistic um, children and young people, and that they have a variety of means to communicate, that they can develop positive relationships with their uh, peers, and that accommodations are made to meet uh, their needs. When we talk about targeted support and measuring progress, that needs to be tied in with the developmental differences of autistic pupils. So actually, there is a need to collect much more data on social and emotional awareness, communication, social understanding, daily life skill skills, independence and autonomy. And the Autism Education Trust's progression framework has been developed exactly to do that. And we had... Professor Sarah Parsons here earlier talking about technology as a tool in teaching in autism. Um, and we do know that there are a lot of positives uh, with using technology um, in teaching. But I'm not going to go into that um, in detail now. So in summary, the last principle is about adapting the curriculum, the teaching and learning, but to focus, not, to focus both on the academic as well as on well-being and success in a much broader way. It needs to be a broad and balanced cur curriculum that addresses the learning needs of autistic pupils and their social emotional uh, well-being. And staff really need to understand the vulnerability that a lot of autistic pupils have to abuse and to neg neglect as a result of their uh, difficulties in social understanding. So I'm going to draw it to a close by saying that making a difference really does require the integration of the best available research, practical expertise in the classroom, and the insider perspectives within the context of the individual person's characteristics, the cultures that they exist in, the values and the preferences uh, of that person. So I'm going to stop there because um, I'm aware that we're heading towards half past Six, I just wanted to briefly say that I'd like to dedicate my inaugural to my wonderful parents who both have sadly passed away. And then I want to thank all of you and the community of autism researchers, practitioners, families and individuals with autism. And if you want to contact me or you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Uh, my email address is up there. Thank you. <laughs> I think Mike is going to say a few words. Is that right, Mike? <laughs> it is, Karen. Thank you very much. <clears throat> just want to check that everyone can hear me at the back. Is that okay if I just speak like this without coming too close to the microphone? So I'm just going to close this and pop that there. Um, my name's Mike McClendon. I'm the Deputy Head of School of Education, and it's my pleasure to try and sum up some of what Karen has said. It's quite a challenging task because there are no rules for this part of the inaugural. I said, what is the job of a summer-upper? And they said, whatever you want to say, you can say. And I said, well, how long should it be? They said, it's entirely up to you, but no more than 10 minutes and no less than five. So I'm going to pitch it around seven and a half minutes. Then we're going to pause. We're all going to go out and celebrate Karen's fantastic achievements. I also want to use this opportunity to say thank you to everyone who's come tonight. Um, I'm talking on behalf of the School of Education, College of Social Science, University of Birmingham. Um, we know in the room we've got people who come from far and wide. I think quite a few from abroad as well, I gather. Some of you have come from Europe to be here tonight, some of you not so far. I'm also aware we have some former colleagues in the audience from the School of Education, so particularly welcome to you, and I look forward to having a drink with you afterwards. 
So rather than just going through the slides again, which I don't think we really want to do in the seven and a half minutes, um, what I want to do is use this as an opportunity to sum up not only what Karen has been saying, but thinking about Professor Karen Goldberg, has a nice ring to it, doesn't it, um, as a scholar, someone who's been engaged in scholarship for many, many years, and someone who tonight, I think, has had the opportunity to showcase the best of what it means to be a scholar at Birmingham University. So I'm going to focus on Karen as a scholar, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, and think about how some of what she said, I think, really helped us understand not just where she's been, where she is, but where she's going in terms of the, her future direction of travel as an academic. Um, so first of all, Karen, thank you very much for asking me to sum up. And I suppose the first thing we should say, Karen and I go back many, many years. We've known each other, I was thinking, probably well over 15 years or so. Um, and in some ways, we've grown up together as academics. We were both involved in the very early days of online distance education. We explored the potential of new technologies together. We championed the status of part-time students. And I know there's many of you in the audience today who are here as students at Birmingham University, so particularly welcome to you. Karen and I have been trying very hard over the years to make sure you're not neglected or forgotten about because sometimes it's easy um, to focus on those who are here all the time and forget those who are part-time. And together we've been trying very hard to make sure that your voice is not ignored. And Karen's been a fantastic champion of part-time students at this university. Um, we've also tried to make sure that where possible, the teaching we're involved in sits on secure foundations. And Karen, I know, is passionate about making sure that the research feeds into the teaching and the teaching feeds back into the research. And I think that's a real hallmark of who she is and what she does. So, first of all, Karen, thank you for being there over the years as what I would say is an academic soulmate. It's been fantastic working with you. We've shared many trials, tribulations, but also celebrations over the years. And so thank you for that. And it's been great to have someone on board, very like-minded colleague, thinking very similar thoughts about not just education, the role of research, the role of teaching, how they fit together. I work in a centre not too dissimilar from ASA. It's about visual impairment education, and probably 90% of what Karen said tonight could apply equally to the field, the discipline that I sit in, in terms of the broad principles that guide us. So again, thank you, Karen, for making that apparent to us all here tonight. An inaugural lecture is a key milestone in an academic's career, uh, obviously, signifying their promotion to professor. So literally, it means she can now profess. Whether or not anyone listens, is another case. Where's, where's the children of the professor tonight? Yeah, just remember now, she's a professor. When she professes, your job is to listen, okay? Um, and it's a unique opportunity to share academic history and also what she's been doing with family, friends, and colleagues. I remember a colleague said to me once, an inaugural is your opportunity for your family and friends to find out at last what the hell you've been doing for the last 20 years. So now, family and friends, if you didn't know what she was doing, hopefully now you've got a better understanding of what she's done. Um, but behind this milestone, which tonight represents, lies a distinctive contribution to a discipline. And it's one I'd briefly like to share with you. So rather than just going through the territory that Karen's explored, I want to draw on Karen, Professor Karen Goldberg. I'm going to keep saying that and remind myself because I think it sounds so nice. Um, as a scholar engaged in what I'm going to call integrated scholarly activities. And I think that's the hallmark of what Karen is, what she does, and what she represents. There are many ways of thinking about scholarship, and if everything goes to plan, I will have a nice model up there. Because this is a model of scholarship which was introduced back in the 90s is in response to some concerns in universities at the time, and no one really knew what academics did. And so part of this report, led by someone called Boyer, was to try and provide a sort of a route map for academics so that it's a way of making sure academics' work really does help society sol solve some of the big problems. It doesn't just sit in the universities. So I think it's a useful framework to explore Karen's contributions to show how 
I would say this inaugural is a master class in academic scholarship. So, oops, what happened there? <laughs> Where have we gone? <laughs> we need the next one. <laughs> All oh, right, okay. Let's make it eight and a half minutes then rather than seven and a half. So there's our model of scholarship, and we've got Karen's. Um, title on the top just to remind us what it is. What we need though is a scholar. So we have a scholar and we have an integrated model of scholarship sitting around that and we have a title I think somewhere and a theme and that nice uh, term again to capture the essence of who we're talking about tonight. So what I want to do now is just briefly talk you through a little bit about this scholarship, this integrated scholarship in relation not just what Karen's been saying tonight, but where Karen's come from, where she's going, and how all these bits connect. And hopefully, it'll help us understand Karen as this integrated scholar. So let's think about the scholarship of discovery. So that's what Boyer said is really most akin to research. When you think about research in university, it's about discovery research. It's very much about disciplined investigation and making sure that you can go and showcase that and celebrate that. And Richard noted in his introduction Karen has an impressive list of published work, funded research projects that reflect that sort of scholarship. I was closely involved with her PhD at the time. That was an important milestone in her career. It was the very early days of online learning. And they were exciting times in many ways because it's new technologies available for learning, but it's very much under-theorized as well, often lacking in academic rigor. And what Karen did was brought discipline investigation to online learning. She helped craft and create new ways of thinking about learning and teaching in the online forum. I was part of championing the role of distance education, part-time learners in universities. And particularly from that came her interest, her, um, her passion for communities of practice. And you haven't said much about that tonight, Karen. I wanted to make sure that people do understand. When I think about communities of practice, I think about some of the big gurus out there, but also I think about Karen as well, being able to champion that discipline investigation to make sure that there was academic rigor in the way we think about communications of communities of practice in online learning. And in many respects, I think it's fair to say, Karen, a lot of what you did in those days, I think, has now been translated into many of the courses that we use today. The way we try and focus to make sure people aren't individual learners, solo learners, but still learn in small communities or large communities as a way of making sure they can maximise the learning potential. So that's your scholarship of discovery ticked off. Well done on that. What about the scholarship of integration? Well, what it says on our slides, synthesizing knowledge across disciplines. And wasn't that wonderful, the way we bring out you know, that term, that biopsychosocial? It's a bit of a mouthful, but what a great way of blending together all these different connections. So really, this scholarship is about connecting new knowledge to existing knowledge, looking at different disciplines. So think how we can solve real-life issues that face society. And a number of you will be here from different disciplines outside of education. You'll be aware of Karen's influence, contributions to developing and championing these synergies. And the questions Karen poses offers a nicely crafted example of how she draws on different disciplines, emphasizes the need for holistic and integrated understanding of autism through reference to perspectives from biological and medical sciences. So again, Karen, thank you very much for introducing that type of scholarship to us and making sure that it's connected in our minds. Richard noted in his introduction that Karen is fully committed to public engagement and impact. And obviously this is reflected in her work with colleagues within ACER, but also the stakeholders who are involved with, a with ACER as well. And that resonates very well with this third type of scholarship. This is the scholarship of application. Is this, in this type of scholarship, 
The application knowledge concerned with greater engagement with the wider community, making sure the knowledge is suitably exchanged, not just transferred, but properly exchanged with other key stakeholders. It's an attempt to make sure we're trying to solve some of the consequential problems that face society. And the questions Karen posed tonight and addressed in this inaugural are certainly consequential beyond just academia. She offers us scholarly insights into how to address these, not only in education, but within society more generally. And Richard alluded as well, I think, that Karen is involved in developing a case study for the Research Excellence Framework, and that will make a powerful statement about the impact of Karen's work and the work of ASA in this area. So again, Karen, it's another strand to that, that notion of integrated scholarship. And the fourth strand, I guess, relates to many of you here tonight, because this is about the learning and teaching aspect of scholarship. The scholarship of teaching can be thought of as being about sharing knowledge to transform learning. It could be argued that good teachers are also learners who engage not only in transmitting knowledge, but in transforming and possibly extending it. And again, Karen's own anecdotes, talking about herself as a teacher and how she learned and what she had to learn in those early days and how that's informed her later practice. I think it's a very powerful lesson for us all. We don't have all the answers. We don't know all the answers. We're all in that learning mode, particularly when we're working with populations so diverse as the ones Karen has been talking about tonight. Those of you as students will be aware from your studies or your background reading the significance of the work from within ASA and particular Karen's contributions to that. Obviously, many colleagues here as well contribute to ASA, and I'd like to acknowledge and recognise all of those. But tonight's about Karen's contributions, and I think it's important to celebrate that tonight as well. As we heard in the introduction, Karen has led the development of a number of online resources for a range of professionals with international reach, and crucially, and to her credit, she still teaches on a wide range of programs, wants to be teaching on a wide range of programs, and is proud to claim her teaching focuses on meeting the needs of parents and practitioners in the field of autism. Two more minutes. Hang on in there. So in summing up, I'd like to share with you a question I pose to new academics when they start their journey with us. It's a deceptively simple question to ask, but can take an academic career to answer fully. And it goes like this. How would you like to shape your field? And new colleagues, when they come, look at me and think, I don't know, I'm just here to do my job. And as we get into academia, we begin to see the importance of how we can go about shaping a field. And I think what Karen has demonstrated tonight is how far she has come in terms of shaping that field. Karen has clearly had a significant influence in shaping the field of autism education over many years at the university. The story of how she will continue to shape her field to rise to the challenges she posed in her lecture tonight will form the basis of her future work as she continues to champion better alignment between research and practice in autism education so that both can contribute to improving school experiences for autistic pupils nationally and internationally. Karen's final slide was entitled Making a Difference, and she outlined very succinctly what needs to happen to achieve such alignment. But that work, Karen, is for another time. Tonight, you can celebrate your significant achievements to date with your friends, your colleagues, and your family. I'm going to say this for the last time. Professor Karen Goldberg, you have provided us with an inspirational session that reflects your status as an inspirational colleague you're an outstanding scholar in every sense of the term, and not just a thought leader, but as my colleague, Professor Julie Allen, who's head of school and unfortunately can't be here tonight, said, also a people leader. On behalf of us all, I would therefore like to end by congratulating you on your significant achievements in re reaching this important milestone. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you now to join us in the foyer for drinks and light refreshments to celebrate Karen's success. Thank you very much. <laughs>